So as you can see from my title, uh, this will be controversial. And, <laughs> but what's a challenge now is that there's so much confusion. Uh, experts have such different opinions as to what we should eat, what we shouldn't eat, what medication we should take to improve our health. Uh, I think what's important is understand why that person has that opinion. Is that person being paid to generate that opinion? Uh, so what is my motivation? Um, why am I here tonight? Why am I as a neuroscientist? Why do I study cardiovascular disease? So in a sense, I have a, what I have is a disclosure statement. Um, first of all, I received no funding at all, no payment for any of the research I'm showing you tonight. Uh, this really began as a personal crusade uh, of my own. Uh, I had extremely abnormal cholesterol, triglycerides, which I've gone into in detail in other talks. But as you can see here, I was in the, uh, in the extreme. This is my risk for developing a heart attack 10 years ago, over 15 times likely to develop a heart attack compared to someone with ideal lipids. Uh, and I took this very seriously, I was concerned. Um, even more concerned was my doctor. Uh, my doctor on a regular basis was near demanding that I start a regimen of statins as well as other drugs. Um, and I was very concerned. Um, I had been studying neuroscience uh, for decades, but I knew very little actually of cardiovascular disease and I knew little as to why I was so fat at the time as well. Uh, <laughs> so. Uh, I felt a little bit like these geese uh, wandering around the, down the road to try to get to the ultimate in health, epitomized by Jack Lane at the end of the road. Um, <laughs> I wanted to get there. I had no idea how to get there. And in a sense, um, all I knew about diet was that Atkins said you can eat all the bacon you want and you get nice and thin and you'll be healthy. So as appealing as that was to me, I didn't really believe it. Um, and in the opposition, you have all the plant-based uh, diet gurus who I had heard they emphasize that that saturated or animal fat will clog my arteries um, and cause me to die at a young age. So I had a choice. I really felt like I could eat meat and die young but happy. <laughs> um, or live my life as a vegetarian, a very long but miserable life. And this is really all I knew 10 years ago. Uh, I decided that I had to take charge of my own health. I was not going to listen to any of these diet gurus. Uh, I decided I need to actually learn the research for myself. I could put my PhD in biology to good use. And so I began with a few papers, which then developed into a few thousand papers and dozens of books on the topic. And I want to acknowledge, actually, that people that I have such a high regard for, which I have learned, from uh, the organizations I've been in and the science writers and the books that they've written. And this is only a partial list of a vast amount of research that I have studied in the past 10 years. And I've distilled that 10 years of learning down, down to a bit about mm, a little less than an hour in which we'll spend together today, which I'm gonna cover um, uh, as to what it is we need to be concerned about as far as our food and what do we think really about cholesterol in our blood and should we lower those cholesterol levels with statins. So essentially we have the diet heart hypothesis, which is the idea that you eat saturated fat, it'll increase your cholesterol and then the increase in cholesterol will then cause you to have cardiovascular disease. And as you can see here in this cartoon, essentially this is just completely wrong. It was never based on any good science and it's been perpetuated really by industry, particularly food and the drug industry. And so my first phase, I'm going to talk about saturated fat uh, diet, saturated fat, and how it influences our health. Does it really cause us to get fat and have heart disease? I'm then going to actually talk about the cholesterol, our fear that the cholesterol in our arteries will block them and ultimately give us a heart attack. And then the critical question is, do we need to lower our cholesterol? What's the evidence of the benefit of a lowering of cholesterol, particularly lowering it with the statins, which appear to be wonder drugs, having such a powerful effect on saving people's lives from uh, that cholesterol that clogs their arteries. And finally, I'm going to try to make the point to you that it is not cholesterol. Cholesterol does not cause heart disease. So what's the alternative to cholesterol that you need to understand what actually does cause heart disease and stroke? So a little perspective here, and I'm only going to cover the diet briefly because two years ago I gave a talk in Ocala and we've actually had great progress 
in appreciating that saturated fat does not actually cause heart disease. So this will be a relatively brief section. But this is an incredibly important paper in which Dr. George Thorpe reviewed over 100 years of research emphasizing that the ideal diet is a low carbohydrate, high fat diet, the best diet for losing weight. So this is in the uh, Journal of the American Medical Association. We knew this in 1957. And here, this is a very important year, 1961. And this is an important finding. And this is an epiphany for me when I just saw this, carbohydrate-induced lipemia. What that means is when you eat carbohydrates, they're converted to fat, and that fat is in your blood. And they're saying how common this is. And it was so powerful, the effect, that they illustrated it by showing someone's blood serum. So in this case, in fact, they say this may surprise some people who don't know the literature. And that lipemic plasma, that is fat in the plasma, occurred when they put a person on a high carbohydrate, low fat diet. And so you can actually see the fat in the serum here. And the same person, in this study of multiple people on different diets, you now have that same person put on a high fat, very low carbohydrate diet, and the same person now you're looking at their serum is clear. They're emphasizing it's from the same person. So it's very clear, we have known for 150 years that a high carbohydrate diet contributes to fat in the blood, contributes to obesity. So that 1961 is important because something else happened in 1961. We have this fellow who I've talked about before. His name is Ansel Keys. And this is 1961. He is on the cover of Time magazine. He is the spokesperson for research in America. He is the dominant figure. And look at what he's saying here in the Time magazine article. Americans eat too much fat, too much saturated fat. It increases blood cholesterol and damages arteries. So Americans need to cut back on the fat to be able to control their cholesterol. You realize this is completely contrary to everything science had shown for the previous century. He made this up. <laughs> it's amazing. Here is the <laughs> He's being interviewed. He is seen as an expert. And I point out as well, he didn't take a single course in cardiovascular disease or nutrition in college. He had a bachelor's degree in economics and a PhD in fish physiology. <laughs> this is the man that was leading American nutrition science into the 1970s, and he was totally wrong. Now, it would be an anecdote to history to me. You say, well, we know he was wrong. And yet, if you go to the American Heart Association website right now, you will see them demonize saturated fat. They will say the saturated fat increases your cholesterol, which it doesn't. There is no evidence for that. And it will increase your risk for heart disease and stroke. Not only that, they're saying keep your percent of uh, saturated fat very low. They're still recommending margarine over butter. They're completely out of step with modern research. So it was Ansel Keys who came up with this idea of the Mediterranean diet. The Mediterranean diet, which supposedly is a diet of the Italians and the Greeks in which it's very low in fat, lean meat and olive oil. And that's why we've got the heart there in Italy. Well, let's look at the actual data. Does the data, do the data support what Keyes said about saturated fat. You actually have data points here from every European nation with the average amount of saturated fat these people consume and the rate of death from heart disease. And what you find is an actually negative correlation. That is, the more saturated fat these people eat, the lower is the risk of heart disease. It's a complete opposite of what Ansel Keyes said. It's the opposite of what the American Heart Association says now. And let's take it to an extreme the most extreme data point are the French. <laughs> Those horrible anti-American Heart Association French people <laughs> who have 40% of their calories from fat and they have the most saturated fat of any country. Far more saturated fat in their diet than Americans. And so you have extremely high saturated fat. And I love this quote from T.H. Huxley, who said, the great tragedy of science, the slaying of a beautiful hypothesis by an ugly fact. <laughs> the entire country of France is an ugly fact. <laughs> and so what should happen when you have a hypothesis in science is you change the hypothesis when the data don't fit the hypothesis. 
But what does the American Heart Association, what do nutritionists in general do? They just sweep it aside and they call it a paradox. <laughs> We're going to take 60 million people and just put them into a box and say, well, we just can't figure that out. It's a paradox. Let's ignore them. Uh, and what is it that the French consume? So they have extreme amounts. They eat animal products, liver and animal food. And in fact, the preference of the French, the three primary ingredients in French food are butter, butter, <laughs> and butter. <laughs> and liver. So with all that saturated fat, all the French women look like her. But what is so annoying about her is she's so terribly thin. So the French paradox is that people have a low rate of heart disease in France despite consuming so much saturated fat. But another aspect of it is how terribly thin they are. And so when you look at obesity around the world, Americans are the fattest people in the world. That's us right up there. And we are still the fattest with the latest news. And we eat the most low-fat and non-fat food of any people in the world. And here are those damn French. <laughs> Less than 10% of them are obese. So they're not only not having heart attacks, they're also not fat. So it's completely inconsistent with the diet heart hypothesis. You still see that fear of egg yolks. Egg yolks, we have this love-hate relationship with the egg yolks. So much cholesterol, so much saturated fat, but they taste so good. And so what you've got is entire industry based on the idea that the egg yolk will kill you. And this right now, you go to the Cleveland Clinic, this is their recommendation. Egg whites have, egg yolks have cholesterol and saturated fat. You want to avoid that. There's absolutely no science to justify this fear of the egg yolk. And so in fact, I give you an example, a meta-analysis of a large number of studies which shows absolutely no relation between egg consumption and risk of heart disease. But to take it a step further, there's a magnificent study that was published with two groups, both on a low carb, really good diet. But to one group, they added three eggs a day, which happens to be three times more per day than the American Heart Association recommends, because if they say you have to fear cholesterol in the egg. Well, the group that had the extra eggs per day showed a greater weight loss, greater reduction in blood pressure, a greater increase in actually what's called the good cholesterol, which when it's higher, you see less heart disease. And there was no overall difference in total cholesterol or LDL, which is called the bad cholesterol. So in fact, consuming eggs is something you should have if you're at risk for heart disease. Again, completely opposite to the way people have been uh, told about this. Now, the epidemiological work is truly atrocious. This is when you hear on the news that people who eat lots of meat die young. That's the epidemiological work. And here is one example. It sounds so impressive. Half a million people, you find out what they eat. Those they eat the most meat, they die young. That's the lesson. Don't eat red meat. Well, this is one example of a truly atrocious study. Um, what they found is a very small increase in mortality, cancer mortality, and cardiovascular disease mortality in assessing the diet of half a million people. But when you actually read the study, it's remarkable to see the findings. This is what those people look like. This tells you about their lifestyle. Paper after paper demonizing red meat shows, well, what kind of people eat the most hot dogs and the most bologna? These are people, basically, who are sedentary, they're fat, and they smoke, okay? And along with the hot dogs, they're eating a whole lot of bread, and they're drinking a lot of soda, and having ice cream. So the meat-eating lifestyle is unhealthy. And it's remarkable to me that these people don't separate the lifestyle from the specific food ingredients. And so the carefully conducted studies have shown there is no relation of red meat consumption to heart disease. But there was actually one other thing about this study that I need to point out. The people who ate the most meat actually ended up in the most car accidents. <laughs> so there's no other conclusion than to say red meat will give you a heart attack and it makes you a bad driver. <laughs> this is the problem, not distinguishing association from causation. It's the lifestyle that is unhealthy for the people who eat the most bologna. 
So here I am actually now on that road, 10 years later, understanding a bit more about the science. The important thing about the Atkins diet, or in general, low carb diet, is when these studies are done, it is a single manipulation. You have overweight people. You don't change anything other than restricting carbohydrates. They lose weight, the biomarkers all move in the right direction. Now, the, the low fat, plant-based diet researchers as typified here by Dean Ornish. Uh, the studies consistently involve multiple factors. You have people who explicitly are taught how to reduce stress. They exercise more. They're told to eat less sugar. They stop smoking. Oh, and by the way, they become vegetarians. So what is it that's helping their health? Well, what they like to point out is that they're cutting out the red meat. But there are so many manipulations that go on, so many factors. And every single study involving the plant-based lifestyle is so terribly flawed because you can't point to any one factor that makes the difference. And I have to say, I've written to Dean Ornish many times. And he doesn't seem to appreciate that I've told him how terribly flawed his studies are. <laughs> <laughs> but the bottom line is the low-carb diet works, and also scientifically, it's better. And so I'm kind of bringing this to a close without covering too much because we have made great progress. And this uh, editorial just came out last month summarizing so much of the recent work written um, by a cardiologist as well as other outstanding scientists in the field. Um, and bottom line is the top line, the bottom line is the top line. <laughs> That's right there saying saturated fat really does not cause heart disease. The reviews are out now and the tide is clearly turning. And so now it is okay to eat butter again and not to have to eat margarine. And so to bring this first section to a close, what is very clear is the good science has shown that saturated fat per se does not cause heart, does not increase cholesterol, thereby increasing your risk of heart disease. Now we get to the cholesterol, okay? Is that cholesterol in your arteries therefore going to clog it and cause you to have a heart attack? Well, I was at a talk recently uh, given by Eric Westman in which he talked about how extraordinary the low carb diet is to reverse a metabolic syndrome. People lose weight, their blood pressure drops, everything moves in the right direction. A clinician pointed out this one increase right here which goes in the opposite direction, that's LDL. So this person is incredibly healthy, but it's because the LDL, the bad cholesterol went up, well now they're at greater risk for heart disease. So that's the great concern. This is a fantastic review of just how wonderful low carb diet is, but the LDL is the great concern people have. Well that comes in part from a fear of cholesterol. And this is a very influential study published in Journal of the American Medical Association, 1986. And what they showed and studied hundreds of thousands of people followed them for many years and looked at their rate of heart attacks according to cholesterol levels. So you have people with extremely low to extremely high cholesterol. And what you find is this increase in the rate of death from heart disease. Any small increase in cholesterol is associated with an increase in death from heart disease. And they made that point in their paper that a 1% increase in cholesterol is associated with a 2% higher risk. So this is part of where that fear of cholesterol comes from. This is a frightening graph. So I actually looked at the data and said, well, what's the actual risk? How many people actually had heart attacks? How many actually died? And so I'm now graphing the actual data from the paper. And so here you are looking at the blue bars. The blue bars show the actual percent of people who did not develop heart disease based on their cholesterol level. So the lowest to the highest, this is the actual rate of people who did not develop heart disease. And they're almost all at 100%, meaning almost no heart disease. Well, to make this a little easier for you visually, I've drawn a line right at 100%. And you see that microscopic difference there? That is a 400% increase in risk of dying of a heart attack. That's what this red line is created from. This is derived from that. Now, how did they do that? And why did they do it is another question. So when you look at the actual data, almost all people down at the bottom here did not die of 
coronary heart disease, 99.7%. So 0.3% died of coronary heart disease. At the highest level of cholesterol, 987 did not die of heart disease. So across the entire range of cholesterol, the difference is 1% in the rate of people dying. And so 1.3% of the people died. So how do you turn that into a 400% difference? Well, you take the extremes. You take this 1.3% and you divide it by 0.3%, that is 4.13. And that's how you come up to this red line up here. You create a 400% increase in heart disease by dividing one ratio into another. And this in great part is why people have feared cholesterol, because of this kind of data manipulation. Now let's go further. Okay, this is the highest level of cholesterol, and you see almost no heart disease in these people. So let's actually look at what's called a disease, in which people have extraordinarily high cholesterol, two to three times normal levels of cholesterol, which is called familial hypercholesterolemia. And any medical student can tell you that if you've got this disease, you're gonna die young of heart disease, because your cholesterol is so extraordinarily high. And so here you have a paper from around 1951 showing high cholesterol, is ultimately going to kill you because the uh, cholesterol gets deposited into your artery. Well, so therefore we make prediction. People that have this disease should die young from heart disease, and if we lower their cholesterol, they should be able to live longer. Well, here's the very first paper looking at longevity in people with this disease. 1966, in this uh, pr prestigious medical journal of medicine, in which they looked at a large number of people diagnosed with familial hypercholesterolemia, no evidence that having extraordinarily high cholesterol shortens someone's life. That people with this supposed disease live into the seventh and eighth decades. And there are many other studies I can show you. It's only because of time limit that I'm saying this is not an anomaly. So I'll show you another one in which you have cholesterol levels in people, and then you look over 20 to 30 years, and you look at their health and longevity. So here is a study in which they had blood uh, levels over the course of 20 years, followed a large number of older people, and what they found was greater mortality in the older people who had low cholesterol. A significantly greater mortality in those who had low cholesterol compared to those who had the highest cholesterol. And I love how their interpretation. We have been unable to explain our results. <laughs> this is really great. They're saying, you know, everybody told us cholesterol is supposed to kill these people, and they're living so damn long. And so there are numerous other studies. Again, this is not an anomaly. This is consistent in the literature. And in fact, uh, to summarize this, I've worked with some outstanding colleagues, and we published this paper uh, last year in British Medical Journal, in which we reviewed every paper ever published on LDL cholesterol and longevity. And what we found is not a single paper in which people died young having high, uh, high LDL. Every single paper, the people with the highest LDL lived as long and even longer than the people with low LDL. And that is summarized here. And this is a quote from our paper. Since elderly people with high LDL live as long or longer, then why would anyone want to lower their LDL and shorten their lives? <laughs> And so in the second phase, does cholesterol therefore clog your arteries and cause you to have an early demise? The answer is clearly no. LDL does not clog arteries, does not cause heart disease, does not kill people. Well, now we get to the big bugaboo, okay? Well, what about lowering your cholesterol? I mean, the statins are the wonder drugs showing a 36% reduction in rate of heart disease. So what about lowering your cholesterol? Does that help you then to have less heart attacks? Is that going to enable you to live longer? All right, well, where did that come from? Where did the idea of lowering cholesterol come from as being heart healthy? Well, once again, we have Ansel Keys. Ansel Keys had the idea that if we can lower cholesterol, then people will be healthier, be less likely to have heart disease, he even talked about hypercholesterolemia. And in fact, he did find that when you consume corn oil, you will lower your cholesterol. And that is a fact. Consuming corn oil lowers your cholesterol. This is what he found in the 1950s. So he suggested in that paper that people should consume corn oil. If you lower your cholesterol by eating corn oil, you're less likely then to have a heart attack. 
And that was actually tested. Here is a study published in British Medical Journal, 1965. And they had two groups of people. They had already had heart disease and they were at high risk of dying of heart disease. They had one group that was put on a low cholesterol, low fat diet, and they had a couple tablespoons of corn oil per day, per day. So they got the best advice of all. The other group, as you see here, they say no advice was given to the control patients. And it's a bit like, well, we're really sorry about this, but um, we need a control group, so you have to go home and die. <laughs> uh, we can share with you our wisdom about cholesterol and all, so you're going to have a high rate of heart disease, you're going to have high cholesterol, and you're going to die. Um, and the outcome was quite nice as far as the cholesterol. And so the people who were on the uh, corn oil, uh, the low fat, low cholesterol corn oil diet, did have a significant reduction in their cholesterol levels. And that in fact is why um, corn oil is seen as heart healthy. Whereas the ones that went home to die and basically could eat whatever they wanted had no change in their cholesterol levels. So the study was success as far as reducing cholesterol. But then when you look at the outcome, the outcome is very straightforward. To stay in the study, you have to stay alive. If you die, you're out of the study. <laughs> Okay. So we're looking at the percentage of people that were still in the study years later. Okay. So if, or if you have a heart attack, you're out of the study. So now we look at these two groups and look at who's still in the study. <laughs> and so the group that was told to go home and die, we still got 75% of them. But the people on the low fat, low cholesterol corn oil diet, only half of them are left. So twice as many people had heart attacks and died in those that had the corn oil. And this is actually has never been shown to be flawed. There is no study that has shown any benefit of corn oil other than lowering your cholesterol. So I like this, this uh, quote from John Abramson at Harvard University. Dying with corrected cholesterol is not a successful outcome. So the goal is survival, not cholesterol reduction. And the authors of the paper made it very clear their findings were unequivocal. Corn oil cannot be recommended in the treatment of ischemic heart disease. So this was the first drug given to people to lower cholesterol and it totally failed. It is still heart healthy. Why is it heart healthy? Because they pay the American Heart Association a whole lot of money and it lowers cholesterol, but it has never been shown to be heart beneficial. Now, decades pass by, which I don't need to cover the details, decades of disappointment. It's not that hard to lower cholesterol levels and drugs and diet uh, persisted then for 20 years and they totally failed. And that's actually reviewed here in the introduction to this paper published in 1984. Many trials lowering cholesterol have been conducted. They call it inconclusive, I call them a failure. So the trials all failed despite the reduction of cholesterol. This was going to be the ultimate study. In this study, you have a half a million men were all assessed, got blood, blood uh, cholesterol levels. You took the 5% with the highest levels of cholesterol. And so you have the top 5%. Therefore, these people were considered to be on their deathbed. And you give them a drug called a styramine, which very effectively can lower cholesterol levels. And you follow them for seven years. And then you look at the outcome in terms of cardiovascular events. This was a major finding. This was a watershed event. This was the first time that reducing cholesterol actually saved lives. And this is copied and pasted directly from the study. Journal of the American Medical Association, the group that had lower cholesterol had a 24% reduction in death, not just heart attacks. This saved lives. What I'm also going to show you, cut and pasted directly from the paper, is that the risk of death was actually not reduced in the treated group. How can you reduce death from heart disease by 24%, but overall, no lives are saved? This doesn't make sense, does it? Okay, we're going to find out how they did that. So I'm showing you the data for the two groups, but I'm presenting the data in terms of subjects that did not have an adverse event, such as death is an adverse event. Okay. We'll all agree on that. So not having an adverse event means you survive. So the rate of survival is almost 100% and absolutely no difference between the groups. That's why there is no mortality benefit. So where, it's kind of a where's Waldo kind of thing, you know, where is that 24% benefit in comparing these two groups? 
Well, it is right there. This is actually a 20, you see that microscopic difference between those bars? That was the watershed event. That's the 24% reduction in death from heart disease. Yeah, yeah, really, I was as surprised as you are now. I'm looking at all your faces going, really? So how do you do that? Well, the actual difference in these groups is 1.6% versus 2% rate of death. 0.4%. Understand, they started with a half a million people. They ended up with the top 5%, 3,800, that had the highest cholesterol of all. Ultimately, the difference between the two groups was eight men, which was not statistically different. That's your 0.4% in that column. And how do you turn 0.4% into 24%? A little bit of statistical magic and hijinks. You divide the difference between the groups, 0.4%, and for no good reason whatsoever, you divide that by 1.6%. And when you do this manipulation, you end up with 24%. You have now reduced death from heart disease by 24%. But the real difference in the population was trivial, was 0.4%. Perhaps you're getting a sense of indignation and maybe this is building in you as well. This is what I've learned in the past 10 years. Um, so, if I were conducting this study, and the evidence was so clear that lowering cholesterol really had no effect whatsoever, I would have basically said we failed. We need to look somewhere else. This is a $150 million NIH study funded in the 1970s. It showed no real benefit of reducing cholesterol. And what do they do? They come out and say it's a total success. We now can stop heart disease, is what the leader, the director, Basil Rifkind, said. This is a turning point in cholesterol heart disease research. That is a direct quote from the article. And they said, based on this finding, we now need to develop drugs that will lower cholesterol even more effectively. And that ushered in the statin era. So understand, everything leading up to the statin era was a total failure. Reducing cholesterol had absolutely no benefit whatsoever. So now we have the statin era. And here, I'm going to show you one of the best trials ever. I'm not looking for subtlety here. I'm going to show you the absolute best trial showing the greatest effect of lowering cholesterol with a statin. This one is Lipitor. This is the drug study that propelled Lipitor to generate $100 billion in revenue. This is where they were able to reduce the risk of heart attack by 36%. So you can feel really good thinking that now I've reduced by over a third the likelihood that I'm going to have a heart attack because I'm on Lipitor. So let's look at that study. Here again, I'm showing you the data, just as I did for the 1984 study. The difference between a torvastatin, which is Lipitor, versus placebo. You see these microscopic differences between the, uh, the Lipitor, which is red. And so again, we're looking at the rate in which an adverse event did not occur. So we're looking at the people that didn't have heart attacks, didn't have a stroke, didn't die. And they're almost all at 100%. So where is that 36% benefit that's in the Lipitor ad? It's right there. Once again, we've got a 36% effect, we got a huge effect with an actual microscopic effect when you actually look at the population at risk. So how do you turn that into 36% reduction? Well, if you actually look at the data, you'll see how they did this. You've actually got a 1.1% difference between the drug and placebo. So about 98% of the people on the drug did not die of heart disease, and 97% on the placebo did not die of heart disease. A 1% difference. And so how do you now turn that into a 36% difference? Because you've got that right here. This has 36%. Did anyone notice along the bottom the blue font on the blue background? Let's expand that a bit. They're actually showing you that it was a 3%. Remember I said 97% versus 98%. So the real data are in the ad. You notice it's a blue font on a blue background. I think the lawyers insisted they put this one in there. So the real difference is 1% and it's right there in the ad. So it's 1% and it's 36% at the same time. The same results. Can you imagine? Well, let's actually show you how they, uh, first show you how they calculated that. Again, 
You take the difference, 1.1% between the two, you divide it by 3% for absolutely no good reason whatsoever, <laughs> except that it greatly inflates the outcome. So now you can say that that difference is a 36% reduction in the rate of heart disease. Are you getting angry? Can you imagine if you had a financial advisor investing for you, and at the end of the year, you've made 1% on your investments? And he says, don't worry, I'm doing 36% better than I did last year. <laughs> it's, a, it's the same thing. It's a manipulation of the data. It's an obscene manipulation of the data. And so think about it. What this is actually showing is that you treat 100 people with Lipitor, one person will have one less heart attack. The other 99 will have no more benefit than if they had the placebo. And so I've changed the ad um, <laughs> to be more accurate. I mean, it seems very reasonable. So Lipitor reduces the risk of heart attack by 1%. If we had truth in advertising, that's what the ad would look like. And I don't know if you'd be as amenable to taking the Lipitor when you've got all the adverse effects, which I'll get into, if you think you're only going to have 1% chance of having one less heart attack. The latest drug, because Lipitor has gone off patent, well, it's been replaced by Crestor, which is now generating billions of dollars. Lots of people now are choosing Crestor over Lipitor because the effects are phenomenal. The person who led this study, and this is the study that kicked off the Crestor, the Jupiter study, said spectacular effects. John Castelline, who by the way, very well paid by the drug industry, is telling you about the results of his study. It is spectacular. It's not only reducing the rate of heart attacks, it is preventing a first heart attack. And perhaps you've seen the ads, this woman is just so happy she's gotten down with Crestor. Okay? <laughs> So let's look at this study, the Jupiter study. You know what's coming, right? Okay, well first I wanna show you how doctors will see the results of this study at a conference. So this is the appearance of the Jupiter findings that would be delivered at a conference. And so you'd see this incredible difference between the groups. So this is the incidence of adverse effects. So there are many more adverse effects in the, in the placebo group compared to the um, Crestor. It's a 44% difference. So this is how it is presented in conferences. The important thing is now we take a closer look. The study was actually terminated at 1.9 years because so many people were getting such a great benefit, they felt an ethical obligation to stop the study at 1.9 years. So the graph actually stops here. This is the 44% difference. And what you're looking at here is actually the instance of adverse events, which actually goes up to 1.0. So if everybody had a heart attack, this would be at 1.0. So this is looking at the rate of heart attacks between the two groups. This is a 44%. I want to prepare you. Okay? The graph I'm going to show you next is not my graph. I have cut and pasted it directly from the New England Journal of Medicine article showing the spectacular results that John Castelline said we get from Jupiter. Just can't take a gander at that. Okay. This is showing the rate of adverse events. This is showing you, so if everybody had a heart attack, the line would be up here. It wouldn't be great if everybody getting the placebos up here, the Crestor is down here. That would truly be a wonder drug. This microscopic difference right there, that was the previous graph that you saw. You take these two lines and stretch them apart because you're only looking at this range in the previous graph. This is the difference between Crestor and placebo. If you are taking Crestor, you can look at this graph and say, why? I mean, this is the difference between taking Crestor and taking a placebo, which is essentially nothing. So again, we look at the data and we have this little fella. And this little fella's looking at the data. And I gotta tell you, I'm looking at your faces. And I've actually lectured to cardiologists. And they have the same face you have. It's like, really? And I would really love for John Kesteline to explain to this little fellow how this is truly spectacular. How we have stopped heart attacks from occurring. Really? Again, looking at the data, this is actually the Jupiter findings. The difference is 1.2%. 
um, between the treated and the placebo group, incredibly trivial. But here you take the 1.2%, which is the difference, divided by 2.8, which is the difference between placebo and 100, and you've inflated 1.2% to 44%. Do you have a sense of betrayal? That the experts really have not been forthcoming with the total minuscule effects that statins truly have on out coronary outcomes. Now they did find something. They weren't looking for this. But people were reporting that they developed diabetes. This is a separate part of the study. They were not looking at this, but doctors were reporting that people on Crestor were developing diabetes. And they were obligated, perhaps, to include this in the paper. This is simply a statement in the results. For some reason, they didn't take the great incidence of diabetes and inflate that and look at the rate of diabetes with relative risk. Well, I've done that for them. <laughs> and so when we look at the rate of diabetes developing in these people, what we have is a 24% increase in the rate of diabetes in the Jupiter study. So when you take Crestor, you are increasing the likelihood that you will develop type 2 diabetes. Now, there are many studies that have confirmed this finding. When you actually look at it, when you get people's blood sugar before going on the statin, and you follow them for years, what you find is a significant increase in diabetes, typically twice the rate of diabetes. So in this paper, which I thank Ken for giving me just today, this paper is consistent with others, but what's so important about this paper, a few things. There is a doubling in the rate of diabetes in people who take the statins. So you're looking at 12.5% of statin users versus 6% developed diabetes. And this has been consistently found. So it is not a trivial doubling. This is going with 6 to 12%. They're also emphasizing here there are no cardiovascular benefits. So their studies, their review found there was no overall benefit for cardiovascular disease. And I want to emphasize the difference here. And I said this in the, at the very first slide. How is it that your opinions are produced? What is it that influences your opinions? What you find consistently is those studies that have shown benefits of statins are very well funded by big pharma. When you find people showing adverse effects of statins, as this one is, there was no explicit funding from uh, big pharma. The work was done at the VA at North Texas. And so I really admire that uh, Mansi's group has been showing adverse effects of statins <clears throat> and they take no money from Big Pharma. Now, 1%, you could still kind of cling to that. Well, I'm still getting a benefit of statins. I'm a little less likely to have a heart attack. And if there were no adverse effects, if there was no diabetes, well, you can consider it. But the peer-reviewed medical literature, and here I just have some of them, have shown so many adverse effects of statins. Erectile dysfunction, reduced testosterone, kidney disease, and everybody knows about the musculoskeletal problems, the joint pain, the muscle pain. And when you go to your doctor and you're on a statin, you say, I've got muscle pain. And your doctor says, what would you rather have, muscle pain or a heart attack? Isn't that what they'll say to you? Well, the reduction in a heart attack is so trivial that that muscle pain is pretty important. And it's very consistent in a high percentage of people. And as well, other uh, adverse effects have been published. Um, and uh, here I want to point out that normally the drug companies stop the studies at about two to three years, which is too soon to be able to see cancer develop in people. But when you look at a long-term study, here you have 10 years of looking at women who are on statins. What you find is that after about 10 years, you then see over two times the rate of breast cancer in the women who are on statins compared to those who are not on statins. So it takes time, but there's a clear connection of statins to cancer in women as well as in men. And so do you think you're going to live longer? The evidence is very clear. There is no evidence at all that statins enable people to live longer. Of course, because they're entirely ineffective and they have the adverse events, um, of course you're not going to live longer. So there is no mortality benefit to taking the statins. And it's right here in their conclusion, no evidence of benefit of statin therapy on all-cause mortality. Uh, much of what I presented here, because I want to emphasize, you will leave here, tell your doctor, I heard this guy tell me that statins are useless. <laughs> And your doctor's going to say, well, who is that guy? I'm right, and you know, he's wrong. You've got to listen to me. I'm the doctor. 
Well, we have published what I presented to you here in a high quality peer-reviewed medical journal, expert review of clinical uh, pharmacology a couple of years ago. I reviewed much of what I've covered in, the, in this lecture in which we covered that elevated levels of cholesterol are not atherogenic, means they don't cause heart disease. Old people with high cholesterol live longer than people with low cholesterol. We describe in that paper how deceptive the entire industry has been using relative risk and I've talked about how there are small benefits of statins that are offset by their adverse effects. So there are slight benefits clearly offset by the adverse effects. And finally, just a bit like, well, what is it you need to worry about and what can you do about reducing the likelihood of having a heart attack? Here is a study in which you look specifically at LDL. The LDL is extraordinarily high. It's supposed to be below 100. These people have it at about 250. There's no difference in cholesterol, LDL, HDL, or triglycerides. And these are people who have one group has heart disease and another group doesn't. No difference in their cholesterol between the two groups. What is different in the group that has heart disease? Clotting factors. The people who have equivalent cholesterol but significantly higher clotting factors. Fibrinogen is one, factor eight is another. These are the proteins that cause our platelets to clump together. And those that had more clotting factors are the ones that had the heart disease. Your blood will clot for a variety of reasons. And that ultimately is what causes heart disease and strokes. And so here is just one example in which you've looked at uh, clotting factor, fibrinogen. And fibrinogen here increased on this scale is significantly related then to coronary heart disease as well as stroke. And you don't see anything like this in relation to cholesterol. So they are clotting factors. You need them when you're bleeding, but when you're not bleeding, they are killing you. Okay? They are blocking your arteries and causing you to die of heart disease. And so here just is a bit of a review. I won't go into detail, but every risk factor for heart disease basically activates platelets. If you smoke, if you have high blood sugar, high blood pressure, um, stress, all increase clotting of your blood. And so that blocks your arteries, contributes then to heart disease. So what you really need to focus on is reducing your blood sugar, not smoking, reducing your body weight. And so these all trigger the clotting that goes on in our blood. And so these are the factors that ultimately will make the greatest difference in improving our heart health. And you can ignore the cholesterol and focus on the lifestyle factors that will minimize the activation of our platelets and cause clotting. So to summarize, uh, I've talked about the diet-heart hypothesis, how it was never based on any good data. It became dogma without actually being rigorously assessed. And so rather than go over the details, what I want to do is quote people that I have such a high regard for and great respect. George Mann battled with Ansel Keys for decades. Ansel Keys was a bully and he was able to get people to follow him. George Mann, unfortunately, was not able to make policy. But he had this to say about Ansel Keys. A generation of citizens has grown up since the diet heart hypothesis was launched as official dogma. They've been misled by the greatest scientific deception of our times, the notion that consumption of animal or saturated fat causes heart disease. That was 30 years ago. Now, Paul Rush, Dr. Paul Rush, is a colleague of mine talking about atherosclerosis and the flaws in the research. And he's published here the belief that atherosclerosis due to high cholesterol has been perpetuated by powerful forces using tactics to preserve the profits and reputations of those who promote this doctrine. And finally, I've had the pleasure to work with Ufi Ravenskov, published papers with him in which he stated the diet heart hypothesis is sustained by social, political, and financial institutions which have little to do with science or any established success in public health. So I feel a bit like when Isaac Newton said he was standing on the shoulders of giants to see farther. And so, well, really everything that I have learned in the past 10 years, uh, to paraphrase that, I've stood on the shoulders of giants to be able to give you this presentation today and to understand that I'm very glad that I never took a statin, that I was able to reduce my triglycerides by 75%. I was able to increase my good cholesterol and all my biomarkers have moved in the right direction. I've been able to lose weight, all by what I have learned 
about changing lifestyle to be able to optimize biomarkers. And I have a chapter in this book which I highly recommend. The title is Fat and Cholesterol Don't Cause Heart Attacks and Statins Are Not the Solution. It's about as straightforward as can be and you've got uh, chapters written by experts from around the world. I thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Okay, the lady right here. My concern, I work with a hospital system and my concern is that we're mandated to prescribe statins for all strokes and heart attacks. And in this era of pay for performance, it's probably coming to cardiologists and neurologists too. Are we seeing anything about the literature changing or the protocols changing? No, you are not seeing any changes uh, whatsoever. In fact, things are getting worse. Uh, we have about 25% of all adults are on statins, and we're looking at approaching, it will be about half of all adults will be on statins, largely because the drug companies, to a great extent, control the media and have a great influence over medical education. So the information I'm giving to you now has not uh, been really been disseminated very well. Now, it is not mandated that people be on statins. Uh, that's your hospital policy. And so really what you need is someone to be able to tell the administrators that what they're giving out to their patients is not good medicine. All the people that evaluate the hospitals have set protocols in place that mandate. So what you just said was that statins are mandated as a part of standard of care. You need to actually understand the guidelines do not mandate statins. They've been very clear about that. They say statins are not required. Um, I think, frankly, they're just covering their ass on that one. Um, but it is, it is really not mandated. At no level has it been mandated. That is actually hospital policy. So we could get into as far as the details, but bottom line is every patient has the right to decide what he or she, medicine he or she will take. Um, and if the hospital says everybody has to be on a statin, well, that's their choice. And that's a bad choice. We've got one right here in the front, our wine drinker. Reducing his platelet coagulation with the alcohol. <clears throat> Good for you. You mentioned something about right at the end about platelets actually maybe being a, a, an issue. Is donating blood and oh, yeah. platelets helpful? That's a good question. So, um, see, platelets um, are that double-edged sword. We need them if we have a hemorrhage, <laughs> if we're wounded, but they're basically killing us. So platelets, um, really donating platelets is probably a very healthy thing to do. I don't know of any research showing difference between donors and non-donors, um, but clearly it's something that most of our lives, we don't need those platelets. So yeah, I think it's probably very healthy. I, I guess I'll have to move around the room, get to the other side next. Just to reinforce, how malicious the pharmaceutical companies can be, and you probably read this a while back, and I don't know when it was, they succeeded in maneuvering the normals for cholesterol down 10 units. Right. And as I remember the paper, it resulted in billions of dollars of profits for them. Because when someone runs a cholesterol and the physician looks at the values, what he sees is many more patients have exceeded the lower levels and the drug companies were instrumental in lowering these normals. That's absolutely right. The levels for prescribing statins have been dropping over the years, adding millions of people to those eligible for those statins. Um, and there's been an outcry against that, um, but it's really been smothered in a sense by those who are paid very well by the drug companies and these are the people in the position of authority. Right. One other quick question. Does aspirin influence your clotting factors at all? Yeah, uh, aspirin actually does reduce clotting and it's totally ineffective at blocking heart attacks. What's a shame, and this is another talk I could give, tens of millions of people are taking a daily baby aspirin um, and they think they're less likely to have a heart attack. The FDA has actually uh, blocked 
Bayer aspirin from saying that you can reduce heart attacks by taking a baby aspirin. When you see that commercial in which the person takes the aspirin and then they're told, you know, you, or they get the note that says you won't have a heart attack if you take the aspirin, it's very deceptive. There is absolutely no evidence at all. You go to the FDA website, there's no evidence that taking a daily aspirin will reduce the risk of a first heart attack. If you're on the way to the hospital and you're having a heart attack, then take an aspirin. <laughs> because right at that moment, all that clotting is very bad for you. But the evidence is very weak even following a heart attack. When you look now months later, very weak that an aspirin makes a difference. So the problem is the aspirin alone is not sufficiently reducing the clotting. Clotting involves multiple actions. On aspirin acts only a subset of those. Let's go on this side. Does the high heart calcium score another reason to take a statin or is it the same as high cholesterol? So first the calcium score is when you actually look in the arteries and you can actually measure how much calcium is in there. And it's potentially of value if someone is extremely high, two, three, four hundred. There is some association of calcium in the arteries. The remarkable thing to me is it has been confirmed that statins increase calcium in your arteries. That is a fact. It's, not, it's amazing in this world. And when the study came out and was published that statins increase calcium in your arteries, they were lauded as saying, isn't this wonderful? Because now it's going to stabilize your plaque. <laughs> it's exactly, I could quote you from their media article. So statins do not reduce calcium in the arteries. The best way to reduce calcium in the arteries is by eating Gouda cheese. I'm not paid by the Gouda cheese company. <laughs> But Gouda cheese has lots of vitamin K2. Vitamin K2 will direct that calcium into your bones and away from your arteries. How about on the other side? I think we got someone very enthusiastic back there, over, over there. Uh, can you talk about the correlation between omega-6 uh, and heart disease? I've seen a study that shows a correlation of 0.99. So uh, what you're actually referring to when you, omega-3 is found in high concentration, particularly uh, in fish, uh, and those who eat lots of fish will have a higher ratio of omega-3. Omega-6 is found in vegetable oils and, and grains. Um, and I, I think what's really important is first, omega-3 is uh, very healthy, and it actually does reduce coagulation. That's part of the reason I think why it's healthy. And the higher the omega-3 relative to omega-6 means you're actually gonna have less coagulation, so that's important. As your omega-6 goes up, what that means is you're eating a whole lot more vegetable oil and a lot more grains, uh, which intrinsically is unhealthy. Um, so I, I think what we want to focus on, what are people eating, rather than the, the components. One more question. Um, how about that? The fellow over here with the beard, he's been, I think he's got something profound to say. <laughs> he's had his hand up the whole time. You keep emphasizing um, decreasing platelet coagulation. What would be the top three ways to do that for the members of the audience? Okay, uh, great, great way to finish this off. So the platelets are extremely sensitive um, when you get stress, and actually part of my research is stress and, and brain and heart, and heart disease. When you get stress, quite literally, your blood clots. And that is why stress is related to heart disease, because you've got clots passing through your blood vessels. So part of this, and actually what Dean Ornish says, is reduce your stress. So you've really got to control the stress. When you exercise, you actually break clots down. So exercise is really fantastic. High blood sugar activates platelets. And so you want to get your blood sugar down. Being obese, okay? Obese people have more platelet activation than thinner people. Cigarette smoking triggers platelet activation. So all of the basic recommendations that people should follow to reduce the likelihood of having a heart attack, other than lowering their cholesterol, <laughs> um, all the other recommendations for lifestyle changes, they will all reduce platelet activation. And therefore, that's, that's why the others are so effective. Di bidang agonet, kami selalu percaya bahwa setiap orang pasti bisa memiliki tubuh yang ideal dan sehat. Dengan subscribe, like, dan share video ini, anda turut membantu membangun Indonesia sehat dan kuat. Salam jelas fitness, saya JP.